touched on the subject of uh, energy upgrades earlier today. Um, what I'll do is I'll do a little bit of a deep dive into the approach that we have learned over several years of practice actually works much better than uh, some of the traditional approaches in the marketplace. So before we deep dive into it, let's try and understand what this actually means for us, right? Uh, now the building energy sector or building sector consumes about 30% of global energy, right? But most importantly, the building retrofits are only forecasted to grow at one to 2% per year. This way, it will take us 50 to 100 years to harvest the energy that we have in that white space that we've talked about, right? So why is there such a big gap between uh, the action and the magnitude of this opportunity, right? So we'll try and explore that a little bit. And we've met with a lot of building owners over the last one year uh, and try to, trying to understand why things haven't moved as fast as they should when the opportunity is so obviously out there. So there were five things in most of the interviews, there were five things that, that stood out in terms of the concerns that building owners had in terms of taking action around building energy retrofits. System implications. Most of them mentioned, I don't know if I do, should I do this first or should I upgrade uh, the chiller or the pump or uh, the tower? I don't know because I don't know what implication that is going to have on the rest of the system, right? They talked about technology risk, technology. I think we had a good discussion on technology earlier today. There's always a risk, you know? Technology is evolving all the time. Should I take that step now or should I wait for the next best thing to come, right? So there's that indecision in the marketplace. Lack of transparency. We learned that, uh, and we mentioned that earlier today, is there, are a, there have been a lot of broken promises in this field in the past. A lot of companies have come out with solutions that haven't worked. The owners have implemented those solutions, but those solutions haven't delivered. And that's a problem. So they don't know who to trust in terms of coming up with the right solution or the right next step. Tenant disruption. We've talked, uh, the panel talked about it. Tenant comfort is the most important thing for a building owner, right? So if I am going to make a decision around an energy upgrade, well, how is that going to hurt my tenant comfort, right? And finally, uh, capital risks. Uh, we talked about availability of capital for energy upgrades. Uh, uh, we'll have our own money man, uh, Rob Dietrich, who will come and talk about uh, the, that there is, there is a great way to actually self-fund these energy upgrades. And Rob will talk, take us uh, through a deep dive in that. So let's start with uh, understanding how do we move forward. Let's start with understanding system implications first. And I will repeat some of the slides. And this is the slide that I had put up earlier today. And I believe it did come up in one of the panel discussions uh, where most of the equipment, as it gets older, it gets less energy efficient. And it, it, there is a, a higher chance of failure or uh, un unscheduled downtime with this equipment. So we all know that there is need for upgrades. But we also know that this equipment has kind of drifted into islands of functionality, which we mentioned earlier today. So the decision is even more difficult in terms of you know, which equipment to upgrade first. So what is the traditional approach to addressing that problem? The traditional approach to addressing that problem is an energy audit. And I think in the INOX example that came up, they did an energy audit. And lo and behold, what was the first thing they, that they attacked? It was the chiller. They upgraded the chiller. And that we found many examples where the energy audits go after the most energy hungry equipment in that room. And that's the chiller first. And then they look at the pump and say, you know what, I'll just put a drive on the wall, let take care of my pump. And that's the traditional approach in the marketplace, right? But what this does is investing in a chiller upgrade is a highly capital in intensive decision. It ties up capital. So what it does is it slows down your future upgrades because now you're waiting for the ROI before you can get more money from your boss to do the next upgrade that you need to do, right? What, what, what could also happen is wrong decision at this point could lead to a lock-in risk. And by lock-in risk, we mean you've made a decision, now you have to stay with it for another 20 years. We talked about the risk of lock-in in energy upgrades or in the white space. 
you do that and your building continues to drift and you continue to lose energy, okay? So what is the right approach? The right approach, and I think we've talked about this in every presentation, is to start by learning about the flow, the flow in forms. And Peter talked really uh, clearly about the importance of flow in understanding the building equipment situation, the system situation, right? And what manages the flow in our body? It's the heart. And to us, and we've mentioned this before, heart is like the pump, an intelligent pump that regulates the fluid flow through an HVAC system, okay? So flow informs what regulates the flow, it's the pump. So let's look at a traditional uh, chiller plant, right? Uh, this is an example of a, this is representation, please don't go by the order or the size of the bubbles there. Uh, but the intent here is that we've learned from practice the first place to start any energy retrofit is to start with the heart of the system first. And the heart of the system is the pump, okay? And in our case, the intelligent connected pump. So when we upgrade the pump, what it does, it immediately regulates the flow in the system. Most importantly, it actually starts giving us information about the equipment and the health of the system. And with the intelligent pump, you make all of that transparent to the building management system, whether it be the energy management system or the, uh, the CMMS or the, the BAS system. The pump, because it has built-in DE technology, starts saving energy from day one. That retrofit is guaranteed cash flow positive from day one, okay? But what a DE pump also does, which we had mentioned earlier, it, it's, it doesn't just look at itself. It looks at the entire system. So once you have the DE pump in the system, it actually brings you saving on the condenser side as well as the chiller side, right? So the total savings with that move is approximately 10%, okay? And this is totally cash flow positive from day one. Most importantly, what this step does, it, it actually educates us or gives us the analytics and the data to make intelligent decisions on what the next step should be, okay? Informed decisions on what the next step should be so that you don't have that lock-in risk we talked about. In our experience, we've learned that the next step is to go after the towers, okay? So turning, uh, converting the towers to variable flow towers. Uh, over here, you can also use tower optimization solutions that Peter talked about. Uh, and Mark also touched on that earlier today. And this could bring in about 20% savings, okay? So we're, like, we're trying to harvest that energy that is trapped in those islands of functionality we talked about. And this is this, the approach, the right approach to doing that. The next step is to actually convert the, uh, to look at the chillers, right? So we'll use the chiller plant optimization that Peter talked about it, and that will give us another 30% of savings. Okay. Now comes the decision that energy audits actually make right up front, and that is the resizing of the chiller. That's the last step in a real roadmap to upgrading the energy, uh, upgrading the plant. If we take this roadmap from our experience, you can stay cash flow positive right through the process. And I'm sure as we are all business people, we understand how important cash flow positive is. Okay? And that way you can save about 40% of energy. So in summary, and I shared this slide earlier today, you start with the pump, you save 10%, learn from there, learn from the flow, and all the intelligent analytics that the pump generates, then take the next step, right, which is primarily from our experiences around upgrading the towers or uh, converting the towers to variable flow, 30% of energy, and then you go to the chiller optimization or chiller resizing, and that gives you another 40% of energy. But notice that the timeline that we have there, the timeline can be shortened. Timeline of system upgrade can actually be shortened to making that chiller decision within a year, 
and inform chiller decisions so that we're not making the wrong decisions. Right? That's the most important piece. So instead of the big long cycle, we go with chiller upgrade first, where we tie in a lot of capital, they even have a lock-in risk. Now we've made an intelligent decision, the gradual decision to actually upgrade with cash flow positive right throughout. So here's a typical example, and Lex actually mentioned about this earlier today, with uh, a typical plant consuming around uh, 70 cents per square foot, or costing around 70 cents per square foot per year. When we upgrade the equipment, it gives us, oops, five cents per, I'm not doing that. <laughs> five cents per square foot. And uh, that could be less than three years in terms of giving us uh, complete uh, cash back payback. Subsystems can bring us another 26 cents per square foot, and that's another could be less than four years in terms of giving us the payback. And finally, the entire system would be around less than five years to about 34 cents per square foot, 30 to 34. And that's how you get that 30 cents uh, out of the, the 70 cents uh, per square foot that you're spending on uh, the HVAC system. So let's... Uh, so that's, that addresses the energy piece. Now let's look at the, the other concern, that was lack of transparency. And we've learned that transparency is the key to establishing trust in this industry, right? Because of all the issues that these, the industry has gone through. We talked about uh, the intelligent pump and how it makes. I think you've seen this slide now a few times. The intent here is this is our value. We want to make actually be absolutely transparent in the way we do things. And that's that value we've added to our pumps, right? Next thing, we talk about the technology risk, and Peter has talked about technology risk uh, uh, earlier, or about our uh, active performance management. Well, we didn't come up with this yesterday, right? We've been at this for a very long time, and we've learned from practice. This is practical knowledge, field knowledge that we've learned from, and Peter and, and team shared that with you. And that, that, to me, gives us a lot of credibility compared to some of the new solutions that have come out in the marketplace, right? So that's very, very important. We have built-in redundancy from a risk reduction standpoint, but hey, predictive ability adds another layer of uh, a, a risk management on top of the built-in redundancy that we have within design envelope. Okay, so we've got layer on top of layer in terms of risk management. Design simplicity, onboard diagnostics and measurements, all this is built into our technology, right? So in terms of technology risk, we've got that covered. And it's not, we didn't, we didn't come up with this yesterday, as I mentioned. We've been at this for a long time. Tenant disruption. Now, this is another one that owners came up with. You know what? I just put a drive on the wall. That's much easier than, you know what, taking a pump out and replacing it. Well, I don't know, new technology, and uh, it'll, take me, it'll take you guys three weeks to put a new pump in. Well, we had to address that issue, right? So we've come up with a special process, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow in our breakout session. We call it the pit stop approach. The pit stop approach implies that we will be able to do an upgrade, uh, on an average, a pump upgrade in four hours. That is, the site, from a site disruption standpoint, there will be four hours per pump. And that will require a lot of pre-work, we understand that. But from an owner's standpoint, we want to cut down the disruptions, any disruption that their tenant might face. Very, very important for the industry. And finally, the capital risk part. And who better to talk about it than our own money man? I have a really good job today because I just have to summarize what you've heard from a number of our panelists with respect to uh, the way the financial, a financial executive would look at uh, assessing an investment in energy upgrades. Every day financial executives look at investment decisions and really what we're looking at is whether the rate of return on the, on the investment we're going to make is, uh, is great enough to cover the inherent risks that we see in the project. And often that will be translated into something you might call a hurdle rate, which is really the rate of return that's necessary on any given investment in the business, in your business, to, 
to make it a, a yes decision rather than a no decision. And one of our panelists said today that they think of that sometimes in terms of number of years of payback. That's really just the inversion of a, of a, of a hurdle rate. Well, the good news is that I'm going to show you that uh, not only will energy upgrades clear these hurdle rates, and I think the hurdle, the, I think the rate of return is much greater than you heard from our panelists, but also it serves to cover other financial risks that the uh, that a building that the building industry faces. So I. I the way that we have constructed, uh, in order to achieve this at Armstrong, we have developed uh, a financing approach for energy upgrades that allows you to save money from the very first day. And, we say, and we, we've said that you have savings from day one. And in this case, this is a, this is a real example of a, of a case where the investment was about $76,000. It's here in, here in Toronto. Uh, you get a $16,000 uh, energy rebate from the Ontario government. So the net investment's about $60,000, and you save $30,000 a year. If you finance this over five years, which Armstrong's prepared to do, then uh, in, you can see that in the first year, you're, you're getting twice as much money in energy savings as you pay for the equipment. And in the course of five years, you've doubled, the, and that just multiplies times five years. Onwards thereafter, the energy savings accrue to you for however long that equipment runs, and typically that equipment runs for 20 years. So in this case, a $76,000 pump retrofit returns over 20 years, which is the life of a pump, retain, returns over $500,000. In terms of the net investment, you're getting about 10 times more money in your pocket than you paid for the equipment in the first place. Now that's a great investment, and I think I could approve this if somebody brought this to me. It, it, it's also, if you have, uh, many organizations have a lot of cash. I mean, I don't want to, uh, if, I, if we talk about Brookfield or Oxford properties, cash is not a problem. Uh, they've got lots of it since they're owned by pension funds. So they might take a look at this, and they might be looking at the chart on the left. It's, it's a negative, uh, they're negative on a cumulative cash flow basis. They're negative for two years, that two-year payback after that it's a positive cash flow all the way through. Pratik was talking about the difference and, and, and in our case study that Basant was discussing as well, the impact of taking a chiller first versus pump first approach with financing. If we take the situation on the right, this is really taking the progression that Pratik just took you through with respect to adding various types of, uh, while well, you're going to the cooling towers, then the optimization and then the chillers, and you can see that you're, you're going to be cash flow positive through the whole period as opposed, to the, uh, as opposed to the approach where you have chillers first, where you go into a very deep negative cash flow position and you're fighting your way out over a number of years before you actually achieve cash positive on your investment. This is a much harder decision for a financial executive to make investing that kind of money. Uh, I, I wanted to just go back um, and mention a couple of other things because uh, the, not only do you get a financial return on uh, energy upgrades, they, it also serves to address some of the risks that the business faces from an operating point of view. And you heard these from the panelists as we went through it. Uh, we even heard it from Lord Resdale this morning. It's inevitable that energy prices are going to continue to increase. That's a business risk that you'll see most uh, most uh, uh, building owners in their financial statements will say there's a risk. If you, abate that if you abate that energy usage through energy upgrades, you have a permanent reduction in the risk of rising uh, electricity rates. And that's a major positive in terms of the risk reduction for the firm. Uh, if, if you have an aging building, or as your building ages, you're facing the, the financial risk that your costs are increasing as your maintenance costs go up and your capital expenditures increase. By doing an energy upgrade, you're refreshing your, your physical plant to the point where you have a lower base of operating cost. That's a, that's a significant financial win for the company. And uh, with respect to technology risk, which Pratik mentioned, 
That's also a risk, a financial risk to the firm. The financial risk to any firm is that you adopt technologies that don't work and you have a sunk cost. With the transparency available with energy upgrades as we offer them, you have the transparency to see that that investment in fact is working. The other point that was discussed, which is a good thing that I think is a good debate with respect to technology investments from a financial point of view, is what do I do? Do I wait or do I act today? And the answer to that is if you have a quick payback on an investment in technology and you can measure it, then by delaying, you're delaying a positive outcome. So I would suggest that in a pump first energy up, uh, upgrade approach as we're suggesting, from a financial risk point of view, you're actually reducing the risk because you're accelerating your cash flow. So with that, with those points, um, I, I just wanted to re-emphasize that from uh, bringing a, a case for an energy upgrade to your financial uh, decision makers should be something that they welcome because you're accelerating the cumulative cash flow of the property, which ultimately on a capitalization basis, increased cash flow equals more valuable property. So in fact, you're increasing the value of the property that you're improving. And at the same time, you're reducing some of the financial risk that the company, that the property is facing. So with that, Pratik, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Rob. So I'll, I'll close off with two quick slides. Uh, one of them is an example, um, a, a case study uh, of uh, the, the Methodist Dallas Hospital, where we upgraded uh, the pumps and implemented an IPC plant, uh, plant solution, plant optimization solution. The total cost of the capital requirement for that was $450,000. The savings in year one were 300, year two, 330, and year three, 330. The cost was recovered in 1.5 years. Most importantly, the decision was the right one, right? In terms of being and understanding the basics of the system before going ahead and making a massive capital investment. So in summary, uh, the energy upgrade, the pump first approach, it's not risky. It actually reduces risk. And we've talked about this in terms of our technology and the, its ability to reduce risk. It increases tenant comfort uh, through resilience and reliability, right? And uh, the flow uh, that Peter talked about. It is cash flow positive from day one. It enables agile investments. And uh, the money men will understand that a lot better than I will. And it increases the speed to green. Well, this is what the summit is about, the sustainability imperative, right? And we cannot achieve the sustainability targets if we do not speed up in terms of targeting the energy hungry white space in these buildings. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Yeah.